This is Perry Stone, host to Manifest. Welcome to the program today. The title that you see here on the screen, It's Time to Blame Christians, may seem a very strange subject matter for a Manifest telecast, but I'm going to show you a pattern. Most of you that keep up with our ministry, you say you really enjoy so much when we begin to share with you the patterns of the past that are repeating themselves today. You know, I've always loved that verse in Ecclesiastes 1, 9 and 10. The thing which has been is that which shall be, and that which has been done is that which shall be done. There's nothing new under the sun. And then he repeats that also, I think, in it's Ecclesiastes 3, 15, somewhere in there. And so basically what Solomon knew and what was believed in his day as well is that if you want to understand what's going to happen in the future, you go back into the past because the past is going to repeat itself. Now, someone say that's just complete, total coincidence. However, when the past is repeating itself during a prophetic cycle or when the past is repeating itself during a prophetic fulfillment, that is extremely significant. OK, so what do I mean by it's time to blame Christians? Well, let me just say something. America has two problems. Problem number one is how Christianity is now being presented or perceived by the secularists. Now, there's always been a problem there all the way back in the time of the outpourings of the Holy Spirit in Azusa Street, back in the time of the healing revival that lasted from 48 to 55, how that the secularists would come into the tents and to the meetings and try to discredit everything that was going on there. That's always gone on, always has, and it will get worse, trust me. But what is this idea of it's time to blame Christians? Well, let me explain this to you. I told you, uh, in a program, a, a program that I that I taught on manifest, that it, America's spiritual patterns are the nation of Israel. What you see happening to nation of Israel spiritually, and even the patterns of the history of the nation, are definitely, definitely a part of the patterns of America. But the biggest patterns from the military, political, economic side have to be with the Roman Empire. Now we're not going to rehash what we've already taught there, but I want to share this with you. If you were to take all the empires of Bible prophecy, Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, Rome, etc., and you were to say what spirit was behind those empires, you'd have to say slavery was the motivating force of the Egyptians. Division was the motivating force of the Assyrians because they uh, took captive 10 of the 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, you would have to say that the Babylonians, uh, when you look at that, was, well, let me go back to the Medes and Persians. They were passing laws that could not be broken against prayer and things of that nature. Greek, the Greeks would be humanism, but Rome would un undoubtedly be tolerance. If you were to have one word to describe the Roman Empire, it was tolerance. However, now pay attention. The Roman Empire leaders, the governors that were appointed in Judea, for example, and the others were okay with a religion or your idea or gods. You could have as many gods as you want. Rome had all kinds of gods. Uh, Rome was built to, uh, believed to have been built by a god. Um, we won't get into all that. So they were, they were very familiar with temples, idol temples, idolatry. So they were okay with that. They were not okay with Christians. And I, I, I started studying this a while back, and um, I wanted to know why the Roman Empire hated Christianity and why they became intolerant of Christians. Stay with me now. It's time to blame the Christians. Here we go. Rome hated Christians because Christians forfeited rights to be treated well. In other words, they forfeited any right for you to treat them well because they rejected the other gods that people believed in. So in other words, instead of rejecting those gods and saying, I'll compromise and say, everybody has a way to heaven. They said Jesus is the way to heaven, okay? And this brings me to the second thing. So they forfeited, fitted, right, they forfeited their rights to be treated good and well because they rejected the gods the false gods and the idols. Number two, Christians were hated because they taught there is no king but Jesus. There is no God but Christ and there is no king but Jesus. Now, many of the Caesars declared themselves deities. 
They deified themselves. So many of the Caesars consider themselves to be God. And so if you were to say there, and, and you were living, let's say, in the time of Nero, who exalted himself like he was some God, he wanted to burn Rome down and rebuild the temples call, and call it Neropolis and put images of himself in all the temples. This guy was a lunatic. But if you'd been living back in that time and you would have taught that Jesus is God, you would have, Nero would have interpreted that as an attack on him. And that's one of the reasons the Christians were persecuted because they believed there was no God but one God and that Jesus was king. All right. Here's another thing. They believed that in another kingdom besides the, the Roman Empire, you know, which was called the Roman Republic, later became the Roman Empire. It was a kingdom on the earth. When Satan tempted Jesus in the temptation of Matthew 4, he said, bow before me. Satan said this to Jesus, and I'll give you the kingdoms of the world for they're delivered unto me to whomsoever I will I give them. Who were the kingdoms of the world? Well, there were different kingdoms, but the Roman Empire was ruling the entire world back in that time. So Satan was offering Jesus the idea of becoming a king of the Roman Empire or an emperor. And if he would bow and worship him, he would be able to set that up. So when they began to teach no king but Jesus, it was an attack against, it was interpreted as an attack against the Roman emperor. When they taught the kingdom of God, repent for the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God is at hand. They were again talking about a kingdom. So how the Romans, and I say the Romans, how the Roman political system viewed this is it was an attack against the government. They were going to create a secret uprising. And the more Christianity populated, you know, they would shut down temples in entire cities. And that, that began to affect the tax revenue. In the, you know, when a temple was shut down and people weren't coming and giving to the idols and the gods, see, the Romans could collect tax money. But when they shut them down, there was no tax money. So that, that made them blame the Christians as well for economic woes. All right. Christians did not want to work on the Sabbath. To the Romans, it was another day in the empire. That was another thing that caused them to hate Christians. Here's another reason. <clears throat> because they believed that their divine knowledge was superior to that of the heathens. In other words, their God was the creator and had all knowledge, but these lesser gods knew nothing. So they said they're attacking everybody else's God. They, they think they're superior. Listen, I hear this in the United States today. From secularists and atheists and agnostics, these Christians think that their God is the only way to heaven. Well, hello. Here's another reason, because they predicted the fall of the empire. They began, you know, let me say this, in the book of Revelation, when the apostle John was on the Isle of Patmos, he'd been banished there as a political prisoner. But when he was there, the apostle John wrote about Mystery Babylon in Revelation chapter 17 and 18, one of those, without a doubt, represents the, Rome, the city of Rome. We know that. One is a political city, one's an economic city. And, and it really, it, both of them could have reference to the same city. But let me say this. We're not going to get into the Mystery Babylon debate here on this program. When John penned that book, he talked about Mystery Babylon. Why? Babylon didn't even exist in John's day. It, it, it was non-existence. So why does he use that term? Because according to Jewish scholars, John used that to veil it for Rome. Rome was representative of Babylon because the Babylonians invaded Judea, they invaded Jerusalem, and they destroyed the temple. And so did the Romans. So instead of saying the Romans and stirring up a, a political mess that could cost you your life, they would use the phrase uh, Babylon or ba the Babylonians in order to conceal the symbolism that represented Rome. Attacking Rome would brought death to you politically. I mean, I mean, Domitian boiled John in oil before he ever went to the Isle of Patmos because he hated him. So these are reasons why. Now, here's the point that I'm getting to. I, I said all of that to get to this point right here. Edward Gibbon, who wrote The Rise and Fall of the Roman Empire, made this statement, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to paraphrase it. In the Roman Empire, when bad things happened, for example, the Nile River didn't rise in one year, a drought struck a, a, a particular area, famine occurred, the Romans conducted an unsuccessful war, an earthquake happened, seasons were disrupted, Christians were blamed by the pagans. 
The pagans believed the gods, their gods, Diana, Aphrodite, Hercules, Apollo, whoever they were, they believed that the gods were angry because of the disrespect the Christians had toward them. Therefore, Christians became the enemies of both the gods that people worshipped and the men who worshipped them. So in other words, blame it on the Christians. If they didn't attack our gods, we would have favor. If they didn't attack our gods, there would never have been a famine. If we didn't attack our gods, there would have been an earthquake. You know, the gods have sent an earthquake because of the Christians. So the problem became this. And I want everybody to hear me because what I'm about to say is very significant. Persecution became so great against Christians that I can't, I'm, I'm, even, I'm not even going to tell you some of the things that the Roman soldiers did to women and men that was so heinous that I don't even want to, I don't even want to talk about it here on a program. It would be, it would be so bad if I started discussing it that uh, you may have some, some stations that would kind of censor that part out. And I don't want to do that. Christians, some of them began to abandon their faith. They would have to go before the leader and either bow and kiss the ring and bow and call him a God. And if they didn't, uh, burn idol, burn incense to an idol, honor the emperor as God, they could be arrested. And in some instances, they were beheaded. And in Nero's day, they were hung on crosses and burned alive. All right. So what happened was some of them bowed and compromised. When they compromised, they lost their faith, purposely did not practice Christianity, did not assemble with the other Christians. And then when that emperor died and the persecution was lifted, if it was lifted during their time of the compromiser, they would then come back to the church, to the bishops, the pastors, and they would say, I repent, I was afraid of persecution and I did wrong. And so this began to happen. They'd go get rebaptized. And then when the persecution started again, some, some of them would be weak and they would go do the same thing because they didn't want to be blamed. They didn't want people to look at them negatively in their community where they lived. So they simply compromised with the pagans, the heathens, with some of the ideas in the Roman Empire. Gibbon, who again is a great historian, also wrote prosperity had relaxed the nerves of discipline. Fraud, envy, malice prevailed in every congregation. This is about the church now. There was a corruption of manners and a corruption of principles. So it not only affected Christians personally, but it started affecting the congregations. And it's really interesting. The church of Laodicea is the last church mentioned in, of the seven churches in the book of Revelation. And it is the lukewarm church. And they are the ones who John said, said to themselves, we have need of nothing. We're rich and increased with stuff. And this is what Gibbon refers to here, that the church got to that place. Well, the end time church is that, is that way as well. In other words, they've got their buildings. Sometimes they're paid for. Thank God for that. They've got their bands, their instruments, their worship teams, their staff, everything's taken care of. And what happens many times is the blessing is great. And so the discipline begins to decline because they see blessing in just acting or living. However, they're acting or living. It seems the blessing is continuing. So there's no change of behavior, which actually is what the word repentance means to change your thinking and way of behavior. So let's talk about Western Christianity for a moment. Let's talk about the problems we have. And number one, Matthew 5, 13, the salt is losing its savor. Here's the verse. You're the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its taste, its strength, its quality, how can its saltiness be restored? It is not good for anything any longer, but to throw out and be trodden underfoot by men. Now, salt was used for sacrifice to keep the meat from spoiling. It was used to neutralize the smell of burning flesh, even at the temple. But salt was also used among the Arabs to, to form a covenant of friendship called a salt covenant in Numbers chapter 18, verse 19. How the salt loses its savor is very interesting. I'm going to read this to you. Water, 
uh, for example, salt loses its salty properties when, when water gets hot, it can evaporate the salt. Salt rock, salt rock, when exposed too long to the air and the elements, eventually weakens the saline part. Salt in houses, when laid on the ancient floors, which they did, it would eventually spoil, become useless. Salt, when exposed to water, will melt and lose its original purpose. So let me just say this. You see, when water connects with salt, it begins to lose its ability of what it's for. <clears throat> now, when you become exposed to rubbing elbows with the way the world thinks with unbelievers, you eventually become like them. You talk like them. You begin to think like them. And then when the gospel message is watered down, it weakens believers. They have no idea what they believe. They have no idea how to share what they believe because they don't know what they believe. And thirdly, when you put the salt in the ancient days, they would put it on the dirt floor and eventually it would just lose all of its savor according to scripture, its ability, its original usage. Uh, if you become too earthly or too dirty, living too low on the floor and not rising up above your junk, the salt will lose its savor. And it's good for nothing at that point. Now, one thing salt does is if you have a, a wound in the old days or a cut, salt can kill infection. Oh, it'll burn. You ever had a blister in your mouth and, and use salt water? Oh, it burns. But you know what it does? It kills the infection. So salt can take out the infection. So sometimes we need to be a little bit more saltier in the word, if you understand what I'm saying, the metaphor I'm using here, to kill the things trying to infect us. All right, let's look at number two, Matthew 5, 15. Here's the second problem we're having. Do not hide your light under a bushel. Now, in the, in the early days when this was written, people had the oil lamps. We show, let's show them a picture of an oil lamp. We have many of them from, for our museum. The oil lamps were, had oil put in them and they would burn bright at night, but... If you wanted to hide your light, let's say that you saw soldiers coming and, and, and the, the, you had lights in the window or lights in the air, but you heard, hey, there's soldiers that's coming. I heard, I heard them coming. Your neighbor warned you. So what you would do, you could blow out the light, but again, the oil may be difficult because there's oil in the wick. You could take your lamps and take a big bushel and kind of hide it under a bushel. I'm giving a very weak example here, by the way, but I'm trying to explain to you what it's talking about. So when you don't tell people you're a Christian, because you're afraid of persecution of them mocking you, you're hiding your light. When you don't witness to people, when you have an opportunity, you're hiding your light. When you don't go to church and you know you're supposed to, and when I say don't go to church, I'm not talking about you're sick or you're missing or there's circumstances physically why you can't. I'm talking about that you just, you just, COVID has made people lazy. People haven't been to church in years, some people. When you do that, you know what you've done? You put your light in a bushel. When you don't invite people to church, you put your light in a bushel. You're afraid of offending people. You don't disagree with nobody. You're hiding your light under a bushel. So how can you be a light, a city on a hill which can't be hid, hid when you're hiding your light, your truth, away from other people? Number three, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? Now, when Daniel was in Babylon, if you'll read the, the book of Daniel, they offered him wine to drink and they offered him meat sacrifice to idols. And he and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they all refused to drink the king's wine because they were from the tribe of Judah. They were actually from the priestly family and that was forbidden. And they would not eat meat sacrifice to idol. And they put him through a test. They gave everybody else the meat to eat and they gave them pulse, which is some kind of a lentil or beans, and they looked better. <laughs> Maybe this tells you something about, about beans versus meat. Maybe the people on the mountain know something. They always used to eat pinto beans and onions during the winter. Peppers, hot peppers. My dad hardly ever had a cold because he ate hot peppers. And I don't know why I got off on that, but I just did. But after 10 days, they looked better and felt better than the people who ate the meat. So it was a test. And we're not, we're not going for against meat here. That's not the point here. The point is that... They had to live in an area that's very dark. Babylon had idol gods, idol temples, worshipped idols, did things that were contrary to what the devout Jews believed. But yet, Daniel said, I'm not going to put out my light just because I'm in a dark place with dark people. And so you have to be careful. Now, when it says fellowshipping, the word fellowship is koinonia. It, it doesn't mean working with somebody. It doesn't mean sometimes you have to go to dinner for a business trip. That's not what it's talking about. But it's talking about becoming intimate, close associations 
with people who are in spiritual darkness. The darkness will eventually overtake you. You'll act like them, you'll talk like them, you'll think like them, and you'll be doing things that they want you to do because you're fellowshipping wrong. So you have to be careful. 2 Corinthians six fourteen is the verse. Uh, I actually have two more things, but let me get to one more. Casting your pearl before swine, Matthew 7, 6. Jesus uses this metaphor. Give not that which is holy to dogs, neither cast your pearl before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. Now, I'm going to tell you what this represents because I've studied this in detail. It represents taking the gospel and trying to share it with someone who absolutely doesn't want to hear it, absolutely curses it and mocks it. You're casting a sacred pearl because in the parable, the pearl represents the gospel before a spiritual swine, which is someone which is a reprobate in their mind. Can I say something to you? There's no sense in arguing your opinion with people on the internet who disagree with you. You may feel better giving your opinion. It is a waste of time. I don't know why people have to comment every time they see something they don't like. They got to comment. They got to talk bad about somebody. Some people don't like themselves and therefore they don't like anybody else. And boy, they can't see the reflection of their own mirror. I know people that are totally belligerent, but if, if, if what we knew on them would come out, ha, huh, you wouldn't believe what it would be. But that's not going to happen because that's not what I do. I believe in taking the gospel to people who want to hear it, and I think it's time to quit blaming the Christians and blame the enemy and let our light shine. That's the message I want to give you. My time's up. I've got a brand new book out. This is my brand new prophecy book. I'm hoping all of you will take time to order it. There's some things in here I know you've never heard. A lot of documentation. Be right back in a minute. Humanity's final battle is being set in array, merging men with super advanced technology. Commonly known as artificial intelligence or AI, this new and at times frightening technology is said to be the greatest advancement of man's imagination since the beginning of humanity. But it comes with warnings from experts and developers. While AI can be used to deter crime, track criminals, and search for information at breathtaking speed, AI could eventually take over 80% of human jobs, replacing them with computers and robots. With AI, nothing about your private life, your finances, job, or family will be hidden. In the future, a male or female humanoid robot can become a walking, talking, live-in companion. Wealthy men are hoping AI will create the possibility of eternal life. According to experts, there are great dangers ahead. Uncontrolled AI systems could eventually destroy humanity. AI could also become a scammer's dream, using fake pictures, videos, voices, and accounts to blackmail innocent victims or transfer funds. In Perry Stone's explosive new prophecy book, Artificial Intelligence versus God, he reveals what others who have written about AI have missed including five ways in which AI will be brought to utter uselessness in the future as God, the creator of mankind, will have the final say as to when nature itself will release unrestrained destruction that will silence both man's modern technology and the electronic systems required for AI to function. Perry's new book presents stunning quotes, biblical word studies, and ancient history to document all the book's eye-opening information. He explains how an ancient clash in Eden and a massive tower in the plains of Shinar conceal huge historical parallels, repeating themselves during AI development. Perry explores whether the economic mystery Babylon mentioned in Revelation 18 could be the new AI city being planned in Arabia. Is China cryptically alluded to in Revelation 12 by the symbol of the great red dragon? Will men and women marry companion robots in the future? Could the image of the beast in Revelation 13 be an advanced AI creation built to introduce a new religion and to be worshiped as a god? Perry exposes the goal of transhumanism and will shock readers by revealing positive proof of five ways God will allow mankind's most advanced technologies to fail in the future. Perry's new book, Artificial Intelligence vs. God, is now available through Perry Stone Ministries. The offer number is BK-036, and you can request your copy for a donation of $25 or more. Order one of three ways, by calling toll-free at 1-888-21-BREAD. That's 1-888-212-7323, or online at perrystone.org. 
You may also send your donation of $25 or more to Perry Stone, P.O. Box 3595, Cleveland, Tennessee, 37320, and request offer number BK-036. This new landmark book is only available through Perry Stone Ministries. Get your copy today so you and your family are prepared for the future of AI technology. We look forward to hearing from you today. The brand new book, Artificial Intelligence versus God, will take you to some stories in the Old Testament that are so parallel being repeated in our day in a different way. And then we give quotes, we give references, word studies, We go into the book of Revelation to prove the thesis of this book. God will eventually destroy man's artificial intelligence. You say, well, where's that in the Bible? Get the book. I'll tell you where it is in the Bible. You'll you'll read about it. And let me just mention, make mention also how important it is, if you can, to register for the International Prophetic Summit, register for Warrior Fest. You have to register to come to these events. There's no fee for either one but register. And also we're coming to uh, Church of His Presence with John Kilpatrick, February the 10th and 11th. We're coming to Abundant Life Christian Center on Sunday through Wednesday, February the 18th to the 21st. And then Thursday, I'm driving down to Beaumont, Texas to One City Church. Pastor Randy Felshaw, my dear friend there. And we're gonna be there Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So please, Texas people, mark your calendar. I've got a fresh revelation, fresh word, new messages, great altar services. I want you there. We'll see you. God bless you. Warrior Fest is back and is bigger than ever with an incredible lineup of teaching, worship, and ministry. This is the event you cannot miss. Mark your calendars for April 5th through 7th at Omega Center International in Cleveland, Tennessee. Warrior Fest 2024 includes impactful preaching from Perry Stone, Chris Estrada, Tony Suarez, Nick Walker, and Amanda Stone. With worship from Catherine Mullins, Eddie James, Lydia Morrow, and dance from Awakened Dance Team and Jacob's Tent Dance Team. Visit perrystone.org to register now for this free event. Come encounter the power of presence, the authority of anointing, and the strength of unity at the place where lambs become lions. Perry Stone invites you to the most anticipated weekend in biblical prophecy. Join us April 25th through 28th at Omega Center International in Cleveland, Tennessee for the 2024 International Prophetic Summit. Come hear the latest prophetic insights from Perry Stone, Jonathan Kahn, Lance Walnow, Bill Cloud, Mark Biltz, and Billy Crone. Go to perrystone.org to sign up now. Don't miss the biggest prophetic event of the year the 2024 Prophetic Summit. Register now.